Uh, to Revelation, the third chapter. I got a, a text this morning from someone in the church. It said this, Hi, Pastor, just wanted to let you know that my daughter really enjoyed being in the sanctuary for the message as she usually is in Sunday school. Wednesday night, she said, Pastor is kind of like a comedian for Jesus. <laughs> I don't, I, I'd rather be a fool for Christ <laughs> than a comedian. Um, but a spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down. <laughs> and, um, I, you know, when my wife and I came in the church, there wasn't children's church, there wasn't power hour, and sometimes not even Sunday school. And kids sat on the pew or under them, and they are able to comprehend more than you can imagine. You know, they can get information from the preaching of God's Word. And so, although we miss those ministries, don't sell them short. Glory to God. Revelation chapter 3, familiar scripture, starting in verse number 14. And unto the angel of the church of Laodicea, write these things, saith, these things saith the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knoweth not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. God wants a zealous church. Then Psalms 149. Verse number three. Let them praise his name in the dance. Let them sing praises unto him with the timbrel and harp. For the Lord taketh pleasure in his people. He will beautify the meek with salvation. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud upon their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. Amen. Lord, we're grateful for your word. We're glad we know what you like, that we can respond in kind according to your word, not our ways, but your ways. Bless the word in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I remember a, a number of years ago, I was downtown Milwaukee, and I had to see an attorney on uh, like the 15th floor of an office building and after I was done with my meeting, I got in the elevator and there were a lot of men and women in the elevator and uh, you know, when you're in an elevator, the protocol is you look at the numbers, you know, that, that's what you're supposed to do. You don't look around at people, you know. Um, but halfway down, uh, there was a, a well-dressed man in there. I don't know if he was an attorney, but he said, all right, I'm not a fanatic 
I bet you're wondering why I'm not wearing shoes, you know? I didn't even know he wasn't wearing shoes, but he had to let everybody know he wasn't wearing shoes. And then he went on to explain, I, I left my shoes downstairs in the lobby to have the man shine them, and he was supposed to bring them up to my office before office hours, but he never brought them up. So here I am in my stocking feet, you know. He didn't want to look like a fanatic, you know. You don't have to look hard to find people who are radical today. They're everywhere. Some who will burn, loot, and destroy other people's property in the name of a cause that they really don't care about because they're frustrated, they want to be heard. I know when I'm frustrated, I go out in the parking lot and break a window or burn somebody's car. It seems to relieve the tension that I have, and, and uh, I don't know what. You may want to check your car after the service. <laughs> the definition of radical is extremist, fanatical, die-hard, reactionary. And then in Weber, uh, Webster's Dictionary, the last definition is conservative, which I was pretty amazed at that conservatives are considered radical. But then I guess I, I wasn't surprised. Did you folks know you're radical? It seems that some radicals are tolerated and others are not tolerated at all. You can break someone's window or burn someone's car and express your frustration, and that's okay, and it's justified, but don't you dare get excited about God then you really are radical, and uh, maybe we are. We are conservative. Amen. Hallelujah. Either you are or you aren't. You're not one or the other. Isn't it amazing that conservatives are considered radical today, off the board, we, we are probably attacked more than the most liberal people on the face of the earth. And in Revelation 3 and 16, it says, So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Now, Jesus is saying this. The word lukewarm here means slightly warm or at room temperature. We all have a tendency to blend into a room that we enter into. Whatever the majority does, we have a tendency to follow or, or emulate those that are in the room. We want to get the room temperature. They are having riots in cities all over the country. A lot of people are making noise, and you join the crowd because you want to be a part of the room temperature or what's going on. People come into the church, and they observe to see what the room temperature is, and then they start to conform. You'll notice that even visitors, when, when we start church and everybody's standing up, I don't have to say, hey, let's all stand, okay? No, because they look at the room temperature, and they don't want to be a radical, so they conform to the room temperature. I did that when I was raised in the church. They were quiet, and I was quiet. They folded their hands and bowed their heads, and I folded my hands and bowed my head. We don't want to stand out in a room, so people have a tendency to become lukewarm or room temperature. Now, when they come into a Pentecostal church, <laughs> well, the temperature rises, and you stand out if you don't get hot. That's it. And either they get hot with the rest of the people or they get cold and leave. Just the way it is. We're not going to become lukewarm to make somebody else comfortable. Hallelujah. They have to be comfortable with the temperature of what's going on in the church. Hallelujah. Well, the temperature rises. Apparently, Jesus has a preference. He said he wants people hot. He even settles for cold, 
because he can take cold and turn it into hot in just a couple of songs. <laughs> but if you walk in lukewarm and you want to stay lukewarm, mm, most people don't want to be thought of as radical Christians. You know, I, I, there are so many people who have said, well, what kind of church do you pastor? And, you know, I could dumb this thing down uh, or I could tell them the truth, you know. We're crazy, you know. <laughs> We're wild. We're free radicals, you know. <laughs> People have a tendency to shy away from religion that are branded radical, and, and that was common in the 70s when I came into the church. Um, if you even talked about tongues, if you even talked about you know, demonstrative worship. It was like, phew, no, I don't want any part of that. But today, you know, we're living in a radical society. People who dye their hair all colors and, and, and we fit in with them. They're looking for something a little crazy, folks. Hallelujah. A little bit off the wall. Glory to God. They're looking for something beyond the ordinary, beyond the typical Lay me down to sleep service. Glory to God. They prefer to be seen as normal Christians many times or, or what the world considers normal Christian practices. But Jesus came to, the, uh, to end a normality or worship as usual. The old sad songs just don't get it anymore. I, I talked to a, a man that I play tennis with. He's a, he's a composer, and, and I sent him one of our song services. I, I mean, it was one of those awesome song services that we had in, in the first week of the pandemic. And, uh, and uh, he said, wow, I've never heard one of those songs before. <laughs> They're so common to us. They're, they're worship songs. They're, they're something that gets your attention and causes your feet to start tapping. And you have to do something about what we're doing. If you look at Jesus teaching uh, in Matthew, the fifth chapter, known as the Beatitudes, the first seven Beatitudes described the true Christian. Being poor in spirit, mournful over sin, meek, hungry, thirsty for righteousness, merciful, pure in heart, and peacemakers. God said, those are the kind of people that I want to put my name on. And the eighth Beatitude predicts that the person who lives as the first seven described will certainly be misunderstood to the point of persecution. When we get to the place where we line up according to God's parameters in the Bible, when we conform to the image of our gods, we'll absolutely be persecuted or labeled radical. Anybody with me yet? The Beatitudes set forth Christianity in its purest form, like, well, the fruit of the Spirit. And what society sees as radical Christians, one defines a radical as extreme. The primary means fundamental. We are fundamentalist. We believe in the... Um, Word of God just as it is. We don't interpret it to make it more palatable for us. And, and to them, that's radical. The whole Bible and nothing but the Bible, yes, that's what we're living by. And, and that's not normal for them. The word radical comes from the Latin word radic, from which we get our English word root. God is looking for root fundamentalist or radical saints. He wants us to stick to the, the very pattern that we've been giving in this, given in the second chapter of the book of Acts. 
He doesn't want us to change from those 120 people who got excited in an upper room and, and were filled with the Holy Ghost. And, and, and they had to tell everybody else around them. And 3,000 were saved in the first day because they were so radical. They weren't bowing their heads and folding their hands saying, oh, that was so nice. Not watered down. Lukewarm. Warmed up Christians. Modern Christianity has progressed so far from the root that we began in Pentecost as to scarcely resemble the original apostolic experience. I've said this before, but I remember being in that upper room in, in Jerusalem, and we, we brought 40 Pentecostals, most of them ministers and wives that were in that room. And, and as we were there, um, we decided, why don't we have an upper room experience? So we all started worshiping God and, and raising our hands and clapping our hands. And then another group came in. And the guys said, this is the upper room. Actually, they acted just like this group over here, you know. I don't want to change from that. There are benefits from being radicals in God's house. But what Revelation 3 is telling us is that nothing less than radical root Christians will do. Enough of religion mediocrity. Most people have just enough religion to inoculate them against the real thing. Comfortable formality, I'm used to it, nothing changes, every service is the same, but you never know what's going to happen in a Pentecostal service. You never know. Hallelujah. People today are, are longing for a real experience with God, not just a form of godliness, not just a routine, not just traditions of a church, but wondering, what's God going to do this time? Because a real radical experience changes people to have power with God. And, and unless you get to the place where you let go and let God, we'll never have the power that God wants to give us, you see. According to Revelation 3 and 16, lukewarm Christians make God sick. They make God sick. The word spew means to vomit out. And when we're just settled in, it's good enough. I'm not going to extend myself. Well, God's saying, no, I, I, that doesn't make me feel good. It seems that anyone in the Bible that, that got a little radical always got what they needed from God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm just saying, when you pull out all of the stops, when you get to the place where you're so desperate for God, well, I'm not leaving here until I get the Holy Ghost. I'm not leaving here until I get delivered from whatever or healed. Then God's saying, okay, all right. You're serious about this thing. Not like, well, I know he can do it, but, uh, you know, maybe next Sunday or next month. Everyone who got a little radical decided, God, I believe your word, and I believe you're going to do it for me right now, and I've seen it happen over and over again. They could not shut up blind Bartimaeus, but he got his sight. Amen. You might think it's radical to tear off a roof, but the man walked away with his bed under his arms. A little radical. Oh. Jesus applauded it. I've not seen such faith. Thank God for free radicals in the body of Christ. We have been set free to be radical for God. Hallelujah. You know, there's a lot of strange things that happen in this world, but I'll tell you, I'd rather be strange for Jesus than a fool for Christ. 
And because our society has become more radical, we are a perfect place for society to come into because they're not looking for religion as usual. They're looking for something that is exciting. Glory to God. Would you turn to Jeremiah, the 31st chapter? Jeremiah 31, verse number 11. For the Lord hath redeemed Jacob and ransomed him from the hand of him that was stronger than he. Therefore they shall come and sing in the heights of Zion and shall flow together to the goodness of the Lord for wheat and for wine and for oil and for the young of the flock and of the herd and their souls shall be as a watered garden, and they shall not sorrow any more at all. Then shall the virgins rejoice in the dance, both young men and old together, for I will turn their mourning into joy, and will comfort them, and make them rejoice from their sorrow. I don't know what the problem is, I don't know what the situation is, but I know that God can turn things around from, from sorrow to rejoicing in one church service. And then Genesis 32. Genesis 32, and verse 22. We're talking about Jacob here. And he rose up that night and took his two wives and his two uh, women servants and his 11 sons and passed over the forge of book. And he took them and sent them over the brook and sent over that he had. And Jacob was left alone and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he, God, saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, Jacob's thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. Uh, if, if we took that attitude that Jacob had, wrestling with God, saying, God, I'm not letting go. Until you bless me. I got dressed. I drove the car here like we heard this morning. Uh, I made an effort to get here. I'm not leaving without you blessing me. If each of us had that attitude every time we came to church, oh my Lord. Hallelujah. And, and God loved that kind of attitude. I will not let thee go except thou bless me. And he said unto him, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, which meant deceiver, supplanter, but Israel, for as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. What God wants to give us is power if we're tenacious enough to stay with God, wrestle with him, if you will, bless me, God, I'm not going to let you go. And Jacob asked him and said, tell me, I pray thee thy name. And he said, wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed him there. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. And as he passed over um, Peniel, the sun rose upon him, and he halted upon his thigh. From that point on, he never walked the same as he did before. From, from that point on, when we were wrestling with God, when God filled us with the Holy Ghost, we never walked the same again. <laughs> Glory to God. Every limp that he took reminded him of the time that he spent wrestling with God. 
And Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. The word wrestle is only used a couple of times in the scripture. Its root word is dust, and it means to be dust or to kick up dust. Could what happened here be viewed as kicking up dust as they danced all night? Could it be that there was a wrestling match, there was a dance, there was, I'm not letting you go, and there was a bunch of dust that was going on. What makes us radical in the eyes of other religions is our extreme emotion towards God. Do you have to be that emotional? Glory to God. But that is the very reason God manifests himself to us because we become emotional. We allow ourselves to become emotional in the presence of God. A woman breaks uh, breaks into an uninvited dinner at the Pharisee's house. Not much emotion going on in the Pharisee's house. Not much emotion going on in the denominal world, if you will. But this woman breaks open an alabaster box full of expensive perfume. You talk about radical. (laughs) She pours the perfume on Jesus' head and begins to weep and wash his feet with her tears, radical. She then began to kiss his feet and wipe his feet with her hair. She she is just what Jesus is, is counting on, somebody who will get beyond, oh, I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> radical, my Lord. Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Okay, okay, okay. This woman was more than a little radical. God doesn't need all of that emotional stuff, really? Really? Hallelujah. I I believe that God longed for 4,000 years in the Old Testament to have interaction with everybody. But it couldn't happen until after the cross. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Uh, Luke, the seventh chapter. Luke chapter 7 and verse 37. And behold, a woman in the city which was a sinner... Now listen, folks, if sinners can get excited about God, who aren't filled with the Holy Ghost, how much more? Which was a sinner when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment, and stood at the feet behind him, weeping and began to wash his feet with tears, and did wipe them with the hair of her head, and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. The room filled with this glorious aroma of this very expensive perfume. Most people believe that it was worth a year's wages, and, and most believe that it was, it was preparation for their own funeral. Now when the Pharisees, which had bidden him, saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he said, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed five hundred pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said to Simon, seest thou this woman? 
I entered into thine house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman since the time I came in hath not ceased to kiss my feet. You can come into church and not even recognize Jesus. You can spend time talking to people about what was going on in your life this week, but I'll tell you what, God is looking for us to give him some attention from the time we walk into this building. My Jesus, I am so glad to be in your presence. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Oh, radical. Wherefore, I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, thy sins are forgiven. Because of worship. Before Pentecost, because of worship. Hallelujah. Mark 14 and 9 says of the same woman, Verily I say unto you, Wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also that she hath done shall be spoken of for a memorial of her. What great thing did she do? Was her life pristine? No. But she knew how to approach God. A realtor friend of mine, um, one Sunday um, after church, met me on the parking lot. Everybody else was gone already. And my wife and I were here. And uh, he said, could I... I just see your church. Could, could you give me a tour? He, he belonged to a denominal church. And, uh, and his first comment after walking into the sanctuary was, wow, boy, you've got a lot of room to dance. <laughs> now, he didn't know who we were except the label Pentecost, but somehow he had the impression We get it on. (laughs) As my parents would say, you could really cut a rug. (laughs) I wasn't sure if he was envious or curious or critical, but I do know that God promotes dancing in church with the right partner. Amen. Amen. Solomon, the wisest man on earth, said this in Ecclesiastes 3 and 4, a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, a time to dance. In, um, in, in the special this morning, um, I'm standing next to Jane, Jane. <clears throat> and she was just, she got an award once for the person who danced the most in the same spot. (laughs) I cannot worship without moving my feet. It's just impossible for me. There's something I, I have to get the whole body engaged in my worship. And, and I've said this a lot of times before. You, you can't find somebody who has danced before God that only did it once. Because there's an expression and a freedom that comes with moving your feet. Uh, you can find people who have never danced, but you can't find somebody who has danced once that doesn't want to do it again, you see. 
The first time the word danced is seen in the scripture is after Israel is delivered from Egypt. It was also the first time for singing unto the Lord. You see, deliverance gives us the freedom to dance and to sing. If you haven't been delivered from Egypt yet, you won't have the freedom to become as radical as Miriam was. Once we're delivered, it's a natural thing for us to sing and dance before the Lord. Amen. Turn to Exodus, the 15th chapter. Exodus 15 and verse number 18. And the Lord shall reign forever and ever for the horse of Pharaoh went in with his chariots and with his horsemen into the sea, and the Lord brought again the waters of the sea upon them. But the children of Israel went on dry land in the midst of the sea, and Miriam, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a timbrel in her hand, and all of the women went out after her with timbrels and with dance. You see, <clears throat> your worship inspires somebody else's worship. And Miriam answered them, Sing ye to the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider hath thrown into the sea. We used to sing that song years ago because we've gotten the victory. Hallelujah. We went through the water and we got freedom. I'm afraid that Pentecostals are in danger of losing the dance. Um, we avoid the twin ditches of worldly dancing and choreo choreographed praise dancing. We don't dance in church to keep the beat of the music or use some of our, our uh, talents of the world. And we don't choreograph what we're doing but it's got to be a spontaneous thing, and it's got to be before the Lord. It's not for anybody else. It's just for God. But we could lose the spontaneity of expressing our worship before God in dance. Mark Twain said this, work like you don't need the money. Love like you have never been hurt. And dads, like nobody sees except God. <laughs> Remember the story of the prodigal son? The elder brother was uh, irritated by the music and the dance. He heard the music of the party going on for his brother who shouldn't have had a party in the first place because he stayed at the farm while his brother went and, and wasted all of his inheritance and his dad was so happy that he said, let's party. Let's pajanga. Glory to God. How dare they dance. Maybe you're going through something. Maybe things aren't going well for you. Don't ever take the attitude, how dare they dance? They don't have a right to be. Don't they know what's going on in my life? You don't know what's going on in their life. And the only way they're going to get out of their problem is to dance before the Lord and, and give him all of the glory. Hallelujah. Glory to God. The best way to get over injustice in your life is to join the celebration. Right. Amen. If you wait until everything is perfect in your life in order to really get with the program and start worshiping God, you'll probably never, ever get to the place where you're worshiping God in spirit and in truth. David, a man after God's own heart, when, uh, when the presence of the Lord came over him, he just could not contain himself. He just had to dance. Ha have you ever gotten to that place where you just could not contain yourself if you haven't? Oh, my Lord, get to that place where you cannot contain yourself. 
I, every time I, I teach on a similar subject, I, I think of a, a world conference uh, my wife and I were at in, in Jerusalem, and, and there, were, there were ministers and, and um, pastors from all over the world that were in this conference, and there was this little black guy, Taclamarian, right in the middle of the preaching. He would just get up, and he'd just start dancing and worshiping. Don't you understand? That's, that's only reserved for worship service. No, he got so excited about what the preacher... I got to dance. Hallelujah. Free radicals. 2 Samuel 6. Second Samuel 6 and, and verse number 12. And it was told King David, saying, The Lord hath blessed the house of Obadiah, and all that pertained unto him, because the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obadiah into the city of David with gladness. And it was so that when they that bear the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, 18 feet, he sacrificed oxen and fatlings. And David danced before the Lord with all his might, and David was gird with a linen ephod. David, he didn't have the same experience that we have, but the ark represented the presence of God, and when the presence of God moves in this place, something should happen to us inside. <laughs> it's not a time to observe everybody else. It's time for you to have passion for God. So David and all of the house of Israel, he must have had some influence. David and all of the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of trumpets. And as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Miriam, Saul's daughter, David's wife, looked through the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. And they brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in its place in the midst of the tabernacle that David had pitched for it, and David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings for the Lord. Verse 20, then David returned to bless his house, and Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, how glorious was the king of Israel today, who uncovered himself today in the eyes of the handmaiden in the servants, as one of the vain fellows shamelessly uncovereth himself. There will always be somebody who will criticize your freedom of worship. We won't criticize people who break windows and burn cars and loots. But get too radical for God. And David said unto Michael, It was before the Lord, which chose me before thy father and before all his house to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord, over Israel. Therefore will I play before the Lord. And I will yet be more vile than thus. And I will be base in my own sight, and of the maidservants which thou hast spoken of, of them shall I be had in honor. Therefore, Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no child unto the day of her death. I want God to bless me. I am... Um, I, I've never been an emotional person until I walked into a Pentecostal church. And then the floodgates opened. 
and the tears started streaming down my face. I would never leave for church when I first came into church without two handkerchiefs because I knew one would not be enough because I was so emotional whenever I got into the presence of God and I did not care who saw. I did not care if somebody didn't think I was manly. I didn't care. It was before the Lord. You see, Jacob sent his family ahead and he, well, he got a hold of God that night. Up until now, he controlled his own destiny through his scheming and his lying and his supplanting. But in the darkness of the night, someone grabbed him and said, let's dance. All night, he pulled and tugged with a heavenly being. The scriptures called it wrestling. The original word is kicking up dust. God might have called it dancing the night away. I've been to the place where I was so involved with God at the altar, so enthralled with the presence of God, and knew my family was waiting, the church was empty, and, and walked away from the altar, and God drove me back down on my knees because he wasn't done with me yet. If I make it to 80 or 85 or even 90, I hope I'm in the same position where I could dance all night. And he was never the same. And neither will you be. I, uh, I said this before, I... This thing has been etched in my mind when my wife and I were in Nigeria and I watched all of these Nigerians worship and, and, and probably 80% of them, when they were worshiped, were dancing before the Lord and I, I, there was this overwhelming presence of God and, and I simply said, God, what is it? And he answered me and said, they're playing before me like little children. If, if, if you don't care who else is watching, and they didn't care. I mean, th literally, they had a bucket that they used for a drum and a guitar that had maybe three strings on it. But uh, they, that wasn't going to stop them right. from entering the dance hall. Hallelujah. I remember also a man at prison who had no hands. And I guess it's easier to worship with your feet if you don't have hands. But he worshiped. He worshiped. We have all of our faculties. We have truth. We've got everything going for us. God has taken care of us. It would be a tragedy if we didn't use everything that God has given us in order to worship him whenever we had an opportunity to worship him. Hallelujah. And, and I believe it releases blessings. It, it releases the Shekinah glory of God. Jehovah Jireh, my provider. He will take care of us as long as we give him the thing that he wants the most, and, and that is worship, folks. And do not hide behind your personality because that's just not a good hiding place. Right. Hallelujah. I don't know what you're going to do that first moment we enter into heaven, but I, I, I think we'll be dancing. I think we'll be worshiping God. We, we just won't have the words. Hallelujah. Glory to God.
I, I know it says that there won't be any tears, but I got to think there'll be a few tears coming down my cheeks because I'm so in love with the God who saved me. Amen. Hallelujah. Bless God. Would you stand with me, please? Glory to God. When you're in love with someone, you become emotional. And when you come to that point of emotion, um, you want to have children. And when we get to the place where we become so emotional with God, there's something inside of us that says, I got to have my own spiritual babies. I want to tell somebody about what I'm feeling. I want to share the goodness of God. But if we just come and get our 40 minute message, 20 minute worship, and that's enough, something wrong with the marriage, folks. There's got to be some intimacy. It's the greatest part of the relationship with God. Amen. And God forbid that we lose that. I never want to lose that excitement for Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah.